My interest uh, today in, in the time that I have is simply to, to discuss the issue of slavery in the context of trafficking and to make the distinction in the first instance between slavery and trafficking. So trafficking is uh, by legal definition, by definition, the movement of a person against their will with the end product being to exploit that person and that exploitation, so the movement taking a person typically across borders, so it's a, a typically an international crime, uh, across borders against their will for various types of exploitation and the exploitation can be for forced labor, for servitude, for uh, what is in the language of the trafficking conventions, for the exploitation of prostitution and also for slavery. So there are various types of, of exploitation. So that's in the first instance then we should make a distinction and to say that slavery is not synonymous to trafficking. That if you wish trafficking, you can traffic somebody into and then exploit them in a context of enslavement, but also in the context of, as I've already said, forced labor uh, or um, prostitution. In the UK context, uh, trafficking is, is rather uh, distinct, I would say. In the first instance, because with regards to forced labor, with regards to slavery, with regards to servitude, what we understand as trafficking holds. The movement of a person into the UK against their will for enslavement. But prostitution uh, is different in the UK context. The definition, the, the UN definition and the European definition talk about the exploitation of prostitution. In the UK context, we've gotten rid of this notion that a prostitute has to be exploited, that the very nature of prostitution makes it illegal, and the movement of a person, a movement of a, a prostitute, without any type of coercion. So if the definition of trafficking, the definition of trafficking has three elements, movement against their will for, in this case, prostitution. In the UK context, we've gotten rid of that second element it doesn't have to, be, there doesn't have to be proof of against the person's will. And this is quite evident in the first case that's transpired here uh, in Northern Ireland, the Matthias uh, Piss case, in which uh, the individual who was found guilty of trafficking, there was no evidence but for the fact that this individual had picked up two prostitutes from uh, the airport in Dublin and gave that person, gave those two individuals uh, a hotel, not a hotel, but a room. So that constituted trafficking in the context of the UK. So when we talk even uh, of the UK, uh, many different countries have different interpretations of what trafficking means. Slavery comes from a different source. Trafficking is quite curious in the sense that uh, trafficking emerges the notion, the very notion of trafficking emerges about a hundred years ago and it, and, it, and it originally is considered white slavery. It was really uh, a, something that emerges in a colonial context when uh, the age of steam is just manifesting itself. So you have steam ships and the railway and white slavery is an attempt to curtail women from traveling on their own for prostitution. The ultimate aim was to control venereal disease with regards to colonial troops. So it's a curious start and approach to the very notion of what we think of as trafficking today. By contrast, you'll, you'll know that the, the source of, uh, of dealing with issues of slavery uh, emerges from the Atlantic slave trade and the unique position that the United Kingdom had uh, ultimately in its involvement in the slave trade but also uh, in the suppression of the slave trade. What remains curious is that for the first time in UK history in 2009 there's the introduction in the Coroner and Justice Act of the crime of enslavement. So there's never been a need or the, for the crime of slavery to exist in the UK until 2009. So it's a curious manifestation that we're now seeing for the first time, the need to criminalize slavery in the UK. So that distinction then becomes 
uh, I think for me in law, quite straightforward, that trafficking is moving a person typically over an international border, but not necessarily. In the, and in the UK setting, with regards to prostitution, there's no need for the movement across a border. Trafficking is the movement of a person against their will, whereas slavery can be the end product of trafficking, but it can be a crime on its own. And that, for me, is the, the interesting part in the sense that there's much emphasis on trafficking today, but I think we should also be focusing in, in the sense of policy about dealing with the end product, dealing with those individuals that may find themselves in a situation of forced labor or enslavement that haven't been trafficked. Right? And ultimately what we're talking about is people who are being exploited. In that context, I want to speak a bit about my research. And that has been to bring life to the legal definition of slavery. The definition of slavery uh, is there. It was established in 1926 in, by the League of Nations, an international definition that was recognized in 26, established in 1926, was opened for negotiation once more in 1956, and again in 2008, and in those two instances, the definition was found to be acceptable, and so it has been affirmed twice. Uh, slavery is the status or condition of a person over whom any or all the powers attaching to the right of ownership are exercised. That definition and the very notion of slavery was throughout the 20th century, so from 26 to the year 2000, was dormant. Those people who had the biggest interest in dealing with slavery, Anti-Slavery International, the United Nations, the League of Nations, said this, that the definition was no longer applicable, didn't apply. They didn't accept the definition, primarily because they wanted to use the, no, the language of slavery as an evocative concept, as a kind of, to inflate what slavery meant by using it in different ways and to call things that they were against. So for instance, in the decolonization process, colonialism and apartheid became slavery, synonymous with slavery. So an attempt to use slavery beyond what its legal and, and natural borders might be, to use it to, to evoke in people a kind of visceral sense that this was wrong. And so you can see how the attachment to colonialism, to uh, apartheid, met that, that um, criteria. What my interest over the last 10 years is, is to try to bring back the legal element of it and to hold individuals responsible for slavery by turning to this definition. So the question was, does this definition, can we still use this definition uh, in the context where primarily it, it has become dead letter law? And the answer is that ultimately yes. So I'll just take you to, through the, the context in which uh, it emerges. In the first instance, what I sought to do was uh, to go back and, and in legal research, uh, if you're unsure of, of the interpretation of a provision in international law, one of the subsidiary means of trying to establish what the language, what it means, is to go back to the negotiating history. So in 2007, I, I spent three months uh, in Geneva in the archives finding everything, everything, everything that has to do with uh, with the negotiations in 1926 and ultimately published a, a very thick book of 800 pages that really spelt out it. It was simply, uh, I was a glorified stenographer, simply writing down what the parliamentarians had said throughout this negotiation process. Um, but out of it emerged an understanding which, and this is really the, at the heart of the first, let's say, breakthrough, is that generally people said that the definition only applied in de jure situations, in situations in which a person was legally enslaved. But as slavery had been abolished, it was no longer possible for me, for instance, to own Jennifer. So what does that mean? It means that I could not bring, if let's say Michael and I had a dispute over who owned Jennifer, we would go to court and a judge would make a determination. In a legal context, in legal, so if in a bygone era I would have owned Jennifer, then I could make a legal claim in a court of law. 
But as slavery was abolished legally, I could never make a claim in a court of law that I owned somebody. But the question then was, could this definition also hold in a de facto situation? So where I didn't legally own Jennifer, but in fact, I treated her as if she was a slave. But then we get into the situation, what does it mean to treat somebody as a slave in a context where you don't own that person? So what I did in the first instance was to break down the definition and to say, so this is the definition of the 1926 uh, convention. What I've done is I've removed elements of it that you see highlighted. And so in the first instance, if we were actually talking about legally owning another, then the, legal defini then the definition would only have to be this top one. Slavery is a person over whom any or all of the rights of ownership are exercised. But that's not what the definition says. It brings in this notion of status or condition. Very quickly, status is a legal status versus condition is this de facto, is this existence without necessarily a legal status being attached to it. So that's the first, uh, let's say, uh, element of the definition that points to the fact that it might apply in a situation where there is no legal ownership but a person is living in a state of enslavement. The second is that we're not talking about a right of ownership. What we're talking about is one step removed from that, of the powers that attach. So you have the powers of, so you don't own something, but you have the powers to act as if you own to it. So when I was uh, finishing and I hadn't even published the book, I was contacted by the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission in Australia and they asked where I was, I sent them uh, my, my research and they said they were going to, as a result, they were going to intervene in a case in the High Court of Australia. And in that case then, uh, the court basically took my approach as the basis for making this determination that in the Australian context, quite rightly so, in my estimation, that slavery does exist in de facto situations. And so uh, the court then spells it out that taking on this notion of status or condition, it said that status is a legal concept and so in many ways it, it is, uh, if you follow the, the leads, it's taking the language that I developed to make the arguments to develop ultimately a determination that in the context of, uh, of Australia that the, the definition that laid dormant for nearly 80 years is applicable. So that's first with regards to status or condition. Now having received that, in a sense, uh, endorsement of my approach, uh, I sought and received uh, research funding to, get to, get, to bring together approximately 20 uh, academics and practitioners, the heads of the two, let's say, leading anti-slavery organizations, Anti-Slavery International here in the UK and Free the Slaves in uh, the United States a number of property lawyers, of his historians dealing with slavery and also individuals who are contemporary who are dealing with issues of slavery um, in legal terms. Got them together and what we sought to do was to, to sketch out what we believe to be these powers. So what do these powers constitute? So what does it mean actually to own somebody in a de facto situation? As a result of, uh, of, hard, of the hardship of having to, to meet first in Bellagio in Italy and then at Harvard, we came up with these guidelines to speak to and to assist. In essence, what we were trying to do is to start a conversation. We weren't going to say, this is what slavery is. We were going instead to start a conversation with judges, with legislators, and let them decide what this crucible, what this what, what slavery means, while we would give guidelines for them to understand and interpret uh, that 1926 definition. And so the essence of it emerges in this second guideline that speaks of these powers. So what does it mean? Well, ultimately, the first thing to take, and, and 
I think the strength of what emerges from this definition is that it stays true to an ordinary meaning of that definition. In other words, the definition speaks of, of in, a, in a property paradigm. And so we've referred to property law and then extrapolated it and pushed it towards giving a reading with regards to indivi individuals. So what are we talking about? What we're really talking about is about controlling, controlling a person. And what does that mean? If you then, if you control a person, then you are significantly deriving that person of their liberty. So where that person loses their own agency, their ability to determine for themselves what they're going to do that day, what they are, their aspirations are, it's lost. And once that you have that control, then you can do different things in the same way that with property, that uh, if I have a pen, I can use it, I can sell it, I can destroy it in the same context of thinking about using a person in the same way, in the same way that destruction is oftentimes in the context of exhausting a person, that you enslave a person, you use them until they're exhausted and then you throw them away. They're no longer of value to you. So use, management, profit, transfer, disposal of a person. So that's the first element of this notion of, of giving the guidelines and, and helping people understand where to draw the line, let's say, uh, with regards to, to slavery. Now, what uh, I think for me the best analogy is to think of it in the context of illegal drugs. Again, Michael. Michael and I have a dispute. We're going to court again, this time not over Jennifer, but over a kilo of heroin. We have a kilo of heroin, but in the same context as slavery, with heroin, it's an illegal substance. You cannot own heroin, right, in the same way that you cannot own a person. But the judge will look to possession. Who controls this illegal substance? Who controls the person? And on that basis, we'll make a claim. So uh, it's not unusual in the context of illegal weapons, of illegal drugs, for this property paradigm to be used to say, who controls this illegal substance? In the same way that an, owning an individual is illegal. But you look to the de facto situation. Who controls and who benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So then if we think about it in the context of slavery and individuals, then we have to try to give parameters in which we acknowledge that certain things are not enslavement and others are. And here in the case, for instance, of a footballer, right, uh, there the headline reads that Mario was sold. Right? But very few of us would say that, uh, that a professional footballer making thousands of dollars a week is enslaved. And so what's missing in that is ultimately this notion of possession. Does somebody control the football player as if it was a thing that was owned? Right? In this context, the answer is no. That Mario might not like it, but he can walk away. He has a choice. Right? And it doesn't happen so much in the context of footballers uh, in Europe, but with regards to American football, you often have footballers who sit out a year, who say, no, thank you. Uh, I, don't like what is, I don't like this trade. I don't like this transfer. I'm going to sit out a year. And they're of such a valuable commodity, right? We're also talking the language of a commodity, that after a year, other teams are, very, are desperate to, to purchase this person. So the point being then is that to sell a person in this context is not enslavement. What you need is that control over a person where they have no ability to say no. Another example is to use a person. Right? In the context of labor, in my context, I am told that I have to teach a certain amount uh, on a weekly basis and it's going to take place in this room. My manager, my head of school, thus manages me in the same context that anybody in employment is managed. They are required to necessarily to be in a place at a certain time. 
We wouldn't say that this is enslavement. What we're looking at then is that extra element, and that extra element is control. You control a person as if you controlled a thing that you owned, that you are the decision maker as opposed to that person, and that's what this loss of agency means, that you decide what that person does, and that person, the enslaved, has no choice. So in this context, you would say that the, a person is enslaved if that control tantamount to possession is there, and then you use the person. Right? They don't have a say. So that's the context in which my research uh, has, in a sense, uh, caught on uh, to fill a gap which, which existed uh, not for very long. It's existed really since uh, the turn into the 21st century with the emphasis internationally on trafficking and uh, with the International Criminal Court and enslavement. And my job, in a sense, as an academic was, as a scholar, was to go and do the research and try to raise this and give it some life to see if it was uh, applicable. The result has been that in law it is applicable and that uh, many NGOs and ultimately it, it looks like what will transpire is that this new area of study in contemporary slavery will use as its baseline the research that I've developed. So for me, the opportunity to speak here is in a sense to make it, to bring it to the attention of also those within the local community, also with regards to policy makers and to have us think about ways to ensure that if we come into a situation in which a person is controlled to the extent that they have no say and are used or managed, etc., then we recognize that this is a case of slavery. Thank you. Thank you.